Welcome to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Hoff from the Mullen Haw Show on 670 The Score. Dan Wieters from the Chicago Tribune. And it is Super Bowl week. We are not in Vegas, but everyone else is the Chiefs and the 49ers will play Super Bowl 58. A lot of conversation. And as it pertains to the Bears, Dan, obviously a lot of the talk continues to surround the number one overall draft pick. When you have that two years in a row, you're going to create some conversation and, of course, speculation. The latest, Cliff Kingsbury. Remember him, the Bears spent a day with him in Los Angeles, interviewing him for the offensive coordinator spot, thought he was going to the Raiders. That didn't happen. He ends up on the Washington Commanders staff. Why is that significant? Well, he did coach Caleb Williams. He is now on the staff that picks second behind the Bears. And there seems to be this groundswell of speculation that that suddenly means the Commanders are in a great spot to trade with the Bears to move up, to get Caleb Williams and reunite him in his hometown with Cliff Kingsbury. It's a really easy storyline to gravitate towards. And then there's other people that know the commander's program really well that say that they have a uh, new power structure there that has a general manager in place that understands what the value of the that needs significant talent replenishment that you have to go about keeping that, that, that stuff together. Now look like that. If you find a quarterback that, this case, Caleb Williams, if the Bears decide that they are not um, hell-bent on making him their quarterback in the future, then those conversations need to be had. I've written a column, David, for ChicagoTrude.com about the roller coaster ride that we're on and one that's only going to accelerate and get more dizzying over the next, you know, 10 weeks. And part of this next part of the, the, the journey on this roller coaster is getting comfortable in hard to know tunnel right? It's really dark. It's really noisy. And there's not a lot of clarity. Um, But right now, you know, you just have to get comfortable there because there's going to be a daily dash of speculation and reporting, and it's all going to be kind of swirling together. uh, And and just being able to to be comfortable with hard to know on certain topics is uh, is very crucial. So since we dropped our last last podcast, Colin Coward from Fox Sports came on both Chicago Sports Talk radio stations on Friday afternoon to clarify, and I think backpedal. He was backpedaling about the idea that he advanced the day earlier. I think we might have even talked about it, that Caleb Williams did not want to play for the Bears. Caleb Williams would not go to Chicago. And he was basing it on some information that he said he had gleaned about eight weeks ago. The specifics, I guess, don't matter now that he has come forward. But after he put that out there on Thursday, he claims to have heard from Caleb Williams' camp and said, whoa, 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 don't don't paint the picture that we're anti-Chicago because they would play, he would play for the Bears. He likes the passion of the football city. He likes a lot of things about the defense, and he compared uh, the Bears to the Texans and able to get to the playoffs. Point is that you're right. This is the silly season. It is going to be a roller coaster because when highly respected, and I do respect Colin Coward, uh, analysts, uh, sometimes even confuse, you know, reporting with speculating, then you're going to get what we got. And that was, uh, uh, I think, a lot of uh, inaccurate speculation based on a premise that just wasn't true. wonder what your reaction was after Colin Coward came back and clarified things. Yeah, so I've got a lot to say on this topic because I think this is part of the roller coaster that we talked about. It is part of the dips and twists and turns and 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 stuff that you have to steady yourself through. And I think it's would be easy to reject a lot or most of what Colin Coward said, but I think you have to take a step back in certain instances and understand um, to people within the league. He does clearly by his own um, acknowledgement, have uh, an information pipeline into people who are close to Caleb Williams, where I think this thing got very confusing is that there was a a very rapidly blurred line between um, sourced intel and kind of opinion-based supposition off of that intel. And it was hard to tell where one ended and the other began. And I think that created in this modern day world of the insatiable hunger for uh, any information, no matter how irresponsible it's presented or, or irresponsible, that, that, that it's just going to take on a life of its own. And that, that's why I think that there's just a lot here to, to understand that like in this world where all this stuff is going to take on um, a life of its own, you have to be prepared to kind of filter it in your own way. I've said for my 
the perch that I sit on, which is one that that you sat on uh, for a long time as a newspaper reporter and and, and columnist, that you have to apply the test of <laughs> you have to apply the test of according to who and based on what, and right. try to f- filter through what that is. In this case, I do think there are things that Colin Coward said that have credence, and it's that, that the Bears clearly aren't an ideal landing spot for Caleb Williams. If he were to choose his perfect landing spot, he wouldn't go to a place that we've expressed the concerns with, has a coach who could be gone in 12 months and replaced by someone else who then forces his development to be interrupted and, and, and changed. So that's there. There's going to be these outside concerns about who the Bears are and where they're at, that said, I do think you have to be very careful and responsible in how you frame the information you have in a way that doesn't give stories life that they maybe not, don't deserve. Yes, because those things are true regardless of who's making the observation. The Bears have a history of not developing quarterbacks. They have a coach who in one year in today's NFL could be in trouble. These are, frankly, concepts easy to grasp for any analyst. What we go to guys like Colin Coward for, because I think they're on a different level because of his access, because of his reach, because of his experience, is that they develop a trust, that you have a reputation that you believe in. But to use those basic premises, which are true and are really irrefutable, to then, I think, take the leap, well, why would he want to come to the Bears? And he said they're concerned about that. They're going to be concerned about that. That That's not exactly the news aspect. If, if he, if Caleb Williams or Caleb Williams' father, which I haven't heard directly, says we do not want to play in Chicago, then that is going to be when I react. So when you have somebody trying to read into tea leaves because of truisms that have always been there. I'm not going to be so quick to it. And I, and I do wonder about – it's unfortunate it came to that because I respect the guy who really misled – his audience. Well, I, I look, I do think that the concerns are real and I, I voice the concerns that um, clearly have have some credence behind them. The question, the follow up question is, what are the what are the consequences for those concerns and what what ramifications do they lead to? The conclusion that a lot of people jump to is that Caleb Williams is going to re- resist the opportunity to become a Chicago Bears if the Bears decide to draft him with the number one overall pick and force him to trade. <laughs> force them to trade him elsewhere to some place that he feels is a, a, a more comfortable destination. That is where this gets off the rails and it gets a little bit reckless because that's just baseless conjecture. And no one has said that. And, 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 and in that regard, you need to have someone on the record. That's either Caleb Williams or someone very directly close to them expressing those concerns in a way that, that it's like, okay, we are, we are going to try to control our own situation here. That doesn't exist right now. It doesn't. And, and and, and, and that that has to be emphasized and re-emphasized while we can still simultaneously talk about the reasons why it wouldn't necessarily be his top choice if, well, so, if he was given the choice. But but those are two very subtle differences, but they're significant. You know, you're you're saying that yeah, he could do that. If you want to gamble your reputation on saying that he will do that, okay. But I just I'm not willing to do that. It's it's all very plausible. You could envision a very Confident, borderline cocky, arrogant even, college quarterback who makes $3 million a year with NIL, whatever, flashy, uh, accomplished, whatever you, however you want to describe Caleb Williams. You could envision a scenario where he looks at the draft and he looks at the Bears and he looks at his hometown drafting second and he says, I would like to engineer and orchestrate something in this draft that I maintain the power and I'm going to maneuver my way to Washington, D.C. That is not implausible. I'm not saying that can't happen. All I'm saying is, from my experience, and I did sit where you sat, and now I'm in a different chair, but I don't, it's not just me. I'm advising I'm, people, when you are basing your opinion on whether or not what I just described will happen, base it on something tangible and real and factual. Right now, it's a bunch of hot air and hearsay. And that's why I think you have to make a distinction. Well, inside hard to know tunnel, we have to be uh, aware of the difference between plausible and 
imminent, right? And there, yes. there's a big difference. And so yes. we have to sort through that. And and, and, and like, th there's going to be a lot of different voices that are weighing in on this topic. I think that's what this illuminated to me more than anything is that the noise surrounding Caleb Williams isn't going to uh, quiet down anytime soon. And it's going to be a long way to, to, to the first round of the draft, which is in late April. I started for that column I referenced, started counting backwards in the, on the save the dates that I need to know in reverse chronological order. The draft may not be until the last week in April, but we've got free agency when trades can be executed coming in the middle of March. And before that, we got the quarterbacks speaking at podiums at the scouting combine on the first Friday of March. And, and a few days before that, Ryan Poles will give us a state of the bears address from a, a lobby somewhere in Indianapolis at the combine as well. And we'll start to, to be able to get tangible information that we can interpret and discuss and try to put, as we always try to do on this podcast, the proper frame around it so that people can distinguish between what is fact-based reporting and what is kind of just discussion points. And that, I think that's that's critical to do, harder to do now, as you know, in this landscape, because people are so hungry for the information. They don't care where it comes from and they don't even care if it's verified or valid because they just want information. And I get, I mean, I get my phone blowing up weekly from friends that that are pretty smart people who will send me what about this bears rumor and it, it's like it's hard to keep track of them all because there's so many that that come across from so many different outlets so before we move on there's only one more point i i, I want to make in terms of i found it interesting as the senior bowl concluded and the super bowl uh week began obviously there's a lot of nfl evaluators a lot of nfl media and a lot of the reports or speculation or clips and wherever you see them a consensus, as we kind of have talked about, Dan, is emerging. Caleb Williams is going to be the top overall pick unless, again, you always have to qualify it, but unless something pops up that hasn't so far. Yeah. But there really is not much doubt about that. When we talk about having the number one overall pick, it's what to do with the opportunity to draft Caleb Williams. No question. And so there are a couple of things I want to say that, that kind of tie in the commanders to what you just said. Number one, if the Bears are seeking a haul, which people want them to seek um, to get rid of the number one pick, to give up on Caleb Williams is to go get a big haul of draft prospects. The Bears don't want to trade with the commanders. They want to trade with someone at number eight. They want to trade with someone at number nine. They want to trade with someone at, at, at number 12, where the price tag goes up, 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 up. When the Bears traded up one spot in 2017, uh, infamously, obviously, to get Mitch Trubisky, they gave up a three, a four, and a future three. Okay, that's not the the historic haul that people in Chicago have been dreaming for trading away the rights to Caleb Williams. And so last year it was okay. Do the Bears want to make a deal with Chris Ballard and the Colts? Do they want to make a deal with the Houston Texans? And the thoughts walking into the middle of February was their best bet would be to go get somebody like Carolina further down the draft board, eight slots down, and now you can really. Uh, play that game and have that auction go to a level where you can make good on it. So the Bears really don't want the commanders to be their trade partner. As far as the commander's desires and goals, you got to understand, as we record this podcast on February 5th, this was the day they introduced Dan Quinn as their new head coach. Cliff Kingsbury was just hired over the weekend. I think they have a few meetings that they've got to get to before solidifying their plan A, their plan B, and their plan C at the most important position in the sport you know and so so like that's why we are in like advance the story about three levels past where it's currently at and that creates the dizzying breakneck confusion that that is going to go along with the pre-draft process every year it's more intense in chicago this year for multiple reasons obviously well put wait until the combine at the end of the month can't yeah. wait for that speaking of offensive coordinators luke getsy gets a job the las <laughs> vegas raiders hire the former bears offensive coordinator so that was something that created a, a, a lot of reaction in Chicago. Dan, we talked all season about the blame pie and what percent to give Justin Fields and what percent to give Luke Getze. And as the season grew on, I think that the portions for Luke Getze were greater and bigger and uh, more substantial. I don't know what this says other than I think it's fair to say the league respects Luke Getze and his ability to put together an offense. It's also very interesting to me that a guy that, that that respect is shown because Antonio Pierce is a first-time head coach who is a defensive guy, and essentially he's hiring somebody for his offense that he trusts to basically take it and run, assistant head coach slash offense. That's Luke Getze in Vegas. Big job, big responsibility, and a lot of surprise Bears fans because according <laughs> to his reputation, 
it was in tatters when he left town and he would never coach again. I think that's a very big uh, development over the weekend in Las Vegas. With my tongue planted firmly in my cheek, I will tell you that Luke Getzey obviously duped the Las Vegas Raiders into believing that he wasn't an issue for the Chicago Bears. <laughs> Theater for us now, right? Like um, Luke Getzey going somewhere else next year and you know, uniting with a new quarterback and trying to apply uh, his system elsewhere is going to give us some good insight into into to what he is as a coordinator with someone other than Justin Fields. That's been the question all along. I think there are mixed sentiments around the league. There, there are people that you talk to that think that the Bears really do further Justin's development in in year year three of his career, and there are others in the league that 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 go through the film, the same film that you and I watched every week back two and three times and saw plays every single game where it's like, man, if the quarterback hits that play, that game changes. If that game changes, perhaps the season changes. If the season changes, perhaps people's career livelihoods change. And so there is a lot there where you have to understand the, 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 the high wire that these guys are operating on and what some of the ramifications are. But because Luke got this job with the Raiders, because he had interviews with the Patriots and the Saints and, and was, was regarded in, in some pockets as a very worthy candidate to take over one of these roles, it doesn't marry up with – the perception on social media and in some pockets of the Chicago media that, that this guy was the, you know, single-minded torpedo that took the bears 2023 season down. It just, that was a, a reality that was created in an alternative universe that doesn't marry up with. It was always a shared responsibility. I, I laughed uh, on Monday morning when somebody called the Mullen Haw show and we were talking about Luke Getze, um, or maybe it was a texter, but, it was just a year ago that people were worried in Chicago about Luke Getze leaving to become a head coach somewhere. So the suggestion was, well, maybe you should get rid of Matt Eberflus to elevate Luke Getze so he doesn't get out of town. Things change quickly in the NFL. Life comes at you fast. Luke Getze pivoted. And you look at you look around sure. the league, when you have 16 to 32 um, teams ha having new offensive coordinators in the last two years, it's not that hard to envision – Luke Gessie getting a second chance in Vegas. Well, he's got one. He's got a reunion with Devontae Adams, who obviously has spoken very highly of him uh, in terms of true. his influence on his development. And now you wait to see what the Raiders do at quarterback. And you wonder, does 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 Luke find himself on a ladder again, you know, trying to climb to a head coaching position if he can do something in Chicago, in Las Vegas? We'll see. We get the opportunity to see now, right? And I think the, 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 the question will be, elsewhere we'll all kind of be watching three different games every sunday to see how how, how three different teams are, are are faring uh great theater great discussion points and and obviously luke uh, lands on his feet i always uh will have a problem with his short yardage calls and maybe it's some of the gimmicky things but i have to be uh objective here when you see why the raiders hired him and what they're looking for when you read the reports out of vegas his emphasis on the running game and success in the running game is one of the things they want to lean into in Vegas, maybe with a defensive-minded head coach. You don't know who the quarterback is going to be yet, but isn't that ironic that Luke Getzey's success in Chicago with the running game might have been a big reason why um, he got the job. The other thing that I chuckled at was somebody asking if this means that, well, the Raiders – will be one of the teams interested in trading for Justin Fields. I think just the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they would not want to reunite those two again because it didn't work well in Chicago. I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. I don't think that, that there's any link between those two things. I, you know, I, a couple last things I'll say is that, you know, there was a narrative kind of put out there that Luke was a, uh, a finger pointer and, and didn't um, hold himself accountable while, while kind of throwing players under the bus. That was never, uh, regarded as as factual by people that worked with him uh both players and coaches inside the building the other part that's going to be interesting as he reunites with the new defensive coach and shane waldron comes in to run the bears offense is you, you, when you are a play caller for a defensive minded coach and this is probably something that shane waldron is going to have to 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 navigate early on in his time in chicago you have to try to figure out how much influence you can have on the head coach in in being able to um play an aggressive brand of offense that the defensive minded head coaches in this league, sometimes situations within games and, and within uh, 
within, within situations in games where where a, a defensive minded coach tends to, to to put the foot over the brake pedal faster than an offensive minded coach wants to. And so I think that's going to be something as we get to know Shane Waldron a little bit better. It'll be really fascinating to kind of hear his philosophy and how he gets his his fingerprints and his and 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 his uh, his desires kind of uh, moving in the right direction. Before we get to the stadium discussion, which I think is a big story in Chicago, wanted to mention the last player item that I have. Jalen Johnson played in the Pro Bowl, whatever the Pro Bowl is these days, the Pro Bowl games. But he did say something in one of his many interviews, something to the effect of his heart is in Chicago, but his mind is on the money. And just a reminder that he did. Uh, I think there was a story in, in the Sun-Times by Mark Potash. He did play up to expectations. He did bet on himself and win, and he will be expensive. He wants to be the highest-paid cornerback in the NFL. This is nothing new, north of $20 million. I wonder, Dan, these emotions, my heart is in Chicago, do they become easier to shelve or put aside with every day that passes between now? It's been four weeks now since the season uh, ended, and longer than that since he's played for the Bears because of the injury in the finale. What do you think uh, about what he said and where this could be headed? Uh, Roquan Smith's heart was in Chicago (laughs) (laughs) until uh, it didn't marry up with. Um, And so like, this is the business, you know, I I love Jalen Johnson. He doesn't lack for self-confidence. He doesn't lack for um, candor. And now we just have to wait and see how he and his agent, uh, Chris Ellison, handle the back and forth with Ryan Poles and, and his contract negotiation team because there is a, a number that they obviously are aiming for. The Bears have to have a number that makes sense for them in their big picture, and they've got to try to get there. The Bears do have the franchise tag in their back pocket. Uh, Ryan Poles was very adamant at that end-of-season press conference in last month that, that Jalen wasn't going anywhere. And you can make that statement when you have plans to use a tag to keep a player under your control. And so we'll, we'll, we'll see. That'll certainly buy him more time. Obviously, most teams that use the franchise tag, it isn't to alienate the player and force them to play on that one-year tag. It's to try to find more time to work through some of the logistics that get them to a healthier value. Um, but Jalen clearly has, has been talking for many months now about, about getting that second contract, which means a lot to these players. And, and he certainly did everything they asked him to do this year. Um, now it's just a matter of how does that marry up financially with what his desires are and what the Bears' target goals are. And and, and that's a, a question that will be answered here within a, a matter of five weeks or so. So by then, maybe we also will have some clarity about the Bears' stadium issue. It has been about a year since Kevin Warren took over. I thought we might be further along, Dan, than we are in terms of knowing when they're breaking ground, what they're envisioning, and where it's going to be. The big story over the weekend in Chicago, Friday afternoon this broke on Crane Chicago Business. Greg Hines wrote a story about how the Bears have shifted their focus from Arlington Heights to Chicago, the South Lot, right by the Shane Waldron deck. I think when you talk about right there, you wonder what that means for Soldier Field, what that means for the city. But the uh, idea behind it is, there's a lot of details, but is that they're going to Uh, propose perhaps or they're leaning toward or discussing a multi-use facility for Super Bowls, Final Fours on the lakefront. So it would be in the city. Kevin Warren is a city guy. Before we get any further, Dan, and some you look at some of the specifics, just want to know, I was surprised at this as a pivot as part of the uh, storyline. This may be a leverage play, but I think we need to discuss it because it seems like it could be more than that. What was your reaction Friday afternoon upon hearing it? Yeah, here I am back in hard to know tunnel trying to figure out my way through it. You know, it's it, it's hard to know because you really have spent a lot of the last couple of years believing that Arlington Heights was the priority for the Bears for a hundred reasons. You know, um, the footprint, the, the 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 ownership of the property, the ability to own their own stadium, the the just the the entire big picture view of this. It made sense. Well, now you see kind of a shift in rhetoric. You see a a shift in tone. We heard from Kevin Warren last month with his outward publicly expressed desires to to put this thing in the city. I know Kevin's think big mentality um, pushes him to have grand visions until grand visions are are needed to be scaled back a little bit. So I don't discount anything about the Bears potentially wanting to keep this stadium in the city of Chicago with that iconic skyline nearby. There's just a lot of questions that need to be 
um, hurdled and answered before we, we get there. And, and so it's, it's another one of these situations where you just better be prepared for fluidity because there's a lot of it. And I know obviously you had a chance to talk to the reporter of that story to get a, a, a lot of insight into, yeah. into what his thoughts are. Greg Hines is from the Crane Chicago business. I want to get to him in a moment, but there are two points I think are worth making because people hearing this and maybe following it in Chicago, maybe following it from out of town that, that are worth kind of reinforcing. Number one is how do you pay for it? Yes. And I think what happens is that you look at it and you, you read the story and it was reported by Greg Hines that obviously there's the Illinois Sports Facilities Authority in Chicago and they have what is called a, in there's a unique bonding clause, which allows, which was tucked into the state legislature or a state bill in 2021. And it allows you to use hotel, hotel tax revenue to sell new bonds to a certain point. And it's, it is something that there aren't, there isn't a lot of knowledge about, but it is also taxpayer money and revenue. And you wonder how that will go over. You wonder if that's the plan, but it was alluded to, and I don't think he's going to pull this out of anywhere. He does know his stuff and he is an expert on those kinds of things. So that financing structure probably would be a significant hurdle in the, in the court of public opinion. And I wonder about that. The other little interesting thing to me is, and this is less to do with the bears and more to do just with Chicago sports. The bears are talking about this on the South lot, uh, South of soldier field, the white Sox, just a couple weeks ago, they leaked plans to, they're looking at lot 70 uh, patch of land called the 78, which is at Roosevelt and Clark in the South loop. Now, Jerry Reinsdorf is leading that charge. You have Kevin Warren leading this one. Nobody really knows how much of this, uh, how much of these funds derived from the unique bonding clause exists. It could be a race to the finish line because this clause expires on the last day of 2024. Both teams want to move on to a new stadium. The Sox probably closer to that, frankly, than maybe the Bears. But it could be a very interesting race to find out Maybe, maybe there's enough money for both. That seems unlikely, but it is Chicago. And only in Chicago do you get something called the unique bonding clause, that which allows us to consider new ballparks and stadiums for two of our sports teams. Yeah, I mean, look, like the, <laughs> the, the, there are so many layers to both of these, right? And, and and trying to sort through this, you know, Kevin Warren told us last month that, that time is literally money in situations like this. And the longer you wait to make a decision on where you're going to put your stadium, the higher the cost of that stadium goes because of all, everything that goes in to, to the industry. And so when you when you use kind of the analogy of a race here, David, it's like you have the vision of Jerry and, and Kevin with like headbands on and, and they're running shorts and getting ready to to, to 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 break from that starting block and figure out who can get to where they want to go faster and it, it'll, it'll all be fascinating to monitor one of the reasons i wondered about this report was because arlington heights that plan would allow the bears to own their own stadium yes. and frankly print their own money because that's the way you make a lot of money and get rich in the nfl that would not necessarily be the case in chicago south of soldier field i asked greg hines on the mullion haw show this morning about that possibility, about the Bears staying in the city, but not necessarily owning their own stadium. My suspicion is that uh, uh, the Bears would not own a city stadium. They would lease it. Somebody else would own it. Um, uh, probably uh, the, the Sports Facilities Authority, maybe the Park District. Um, and yeah, that would be an asset they wouldn't carry on their books, but they wouldn't carry all the liabilities either. Uh, so it's kind of a wash. Whereas out in Arlington Heights, uh, it, it would uh, it would be their project. Um, uh, they may be in a position to get more help uh, financially in the city uh, than they are uh, to do this. Um, but uh, uh, the bottom line is is that uh, is that uh, I think is they're going to do what the bottom line dictates. Um, uh, and right now. Uh, that although they haven't gone public and haven't explained it, they seem to be very fascinated with the Chicago concept and seem to think it's a better deal. We'll have to have them explain it and, and tell us why it's better than owning a piece of property. <clears throat> but I'm going to repeat again that uh, the team ownership, the McCaskey House, is, is this is a, this is a family. They have limited assets, as, as you go. I mean, they're not the kind of sports billionaires some other some other owners are. Um, I don't think they want to dilute ownership by bringing in new folks, and they don't want to borrow a bunch of money. So that kind of limits what they can do a little bit. So whatever they wanted to do, I asked Greg next about when they might come public with this proposal. This is what he had to say. Are they close to coming public with a proposal? 
I think so. Um, uh, if if they want to take advantage of this provision uh, in the, the law on the bonds, they've got to do it this year. Well, the legislature's in session now. <clears throat> It'll be in session until uh, probably around the, the end of May, uh, around Memorial Day. Then the legislature breaks and uh, and comes back uh, for what's known as a veto session in the fall, where a lot of legislation like this kind of runs. My hunch is that there is that the fall is probably more likely than the spring, but uh, there is no question that uh, uh, they seem to be getting ready and uh, they're aware, very aware of the timetable. Hmm. The plot thickens, Dan. What do you think? Man, you know, everything circles back to the concept of who pays for this and then and then who gains from it. And the, the idea of remaining a tenant of the Chicago Park District to me just seems like a complete step down from what this two plus year vision was to, to kind of create your own amusement park, so to speak, with and business district and entertainment and a Bears museum and everything else to, to your point that could permit print money if you um abandon the arlington heights plan as well you've got to find somebody to buy that land from you i don't know that you're going to get uh an easy someone driving down the street saying oh well, it's, it's just a cool 205 million dollars for 326 acres of property let's figure that out um so many layers to this right now david and so much complex business and political uh I don't know what you'd call it, logistics to it, to the, to the whole thing that, that create dynamics that are going to be hard to sift through. It just feels like it's another instance where the Bears' initial vision in Arlington Heights, when they first put in the purchase agreement on the property, which I think is coming up on, on three years now, yep. uh, the vision for what they wanted to do with it didn't seem crystallized enough. And now you have a team president who wasn't in place at the time that that purchase agreement began through this project it just feels like another example where they did things in out of order that, that, that order. you might want to yeah. do yeah i wonder if the sacrifice of not owning your own stadium would be worth it for the bears to stay in the city for a lot of different reasons i wonder about the logistics uh of building a stadium there what to do with soldier field what to do about the landmark status of the colonnades a lot of the things that are traditional on the museum campus, a lot of those questions that have, you know, remain unanswered and we'll find out. And and I get I think the the other thing of it is, and, and this is like a moving away from the Bears and the White Sox, but you know, the city of Chicago has a lot of issues um, to address. And I just it, we, this is what we do. We love it. We're, we make a living in sports media um, for the teams that we cover. I, I do wonder if, you know, the priorities would shift. You'd have a, either a stadium project uh, south of Soldier Field to, for the Bears' new $2 billion home, or you'd have uh, a stadium project or a ballpark project at, in the South Loop uh, at the 78. Could you have both? I don't know. There's a lot going on in Chicago. Do you have the infrastructure? Do you have the uh, economic resources? Do you have the wherewithal to attack two projects like that? A lot of questions remain unanswered, but they're worth asking. And this story is not going anywhere. You also mentioned infrastructure and logistics to, to take over that land south of Soldier Field. How are you solving some of the logistics and infrastructure problems that currently exist with traffic flow and the ability for cars to park and, and getting in and out of Soldier Field when you're going to have this massive construction project right next to a place where you're going to have to keep playing, <laughs> you know, and then how do you make all, all of that work? There, there's a hundred unanswered questions to this. Um, again, to your very first sentiment when you brought the story up in this uh, episode is, is that you just felt like at this point, February, 2024, we were going to feel like we were further along toward a destination where it feels like now it's kind of like you're at a rest stop and you're like, okay, you know, which, which way do we go? What, what, which direction are we even aiming at anymore? Uh, and pretty soon I think the bears are gonna have to provide clarity on that because again, with every day, week, month that passes, the price of the project changes, you know, and you've got to be aware of that and, and figure out where it's all coming from. One more thing to talk about this off season. And yeah, yeah we, didn't ha we didn't have anything. We didn't yeah, have anything exactly. else to discuss. All right, Dan, I think that wraps it up. Anything else that we forgot? No, I will say the two last things. I did watch all of the Pro Bowl games on Thursday oh, night gosh. and Sunday. That was a request by my son. I found them to be uh, uh, pretty lame, but he was incredibly entertained from start to finish. So maybe I'm not the target audience for those anymore. Number two, as you know, this is Super Bowl week, which means it's NFL Honors week, which means we can tease once again to the pod. 
Hall of Fame um, announcements coming this week, potentially for uh, former Bears Steve McMichael, Devin Hester, and Julius Peppers. It's going to be really fascinating to see how those cases turn out this week. But I think there's a lot of people in the Bears family that are looking forward to, to whatever happens on Thursday and, and figuring out what it means. It's a good reminder, and we will be here to talk about what happened and react to the news, and let's hope it's good news, and also make our Super Bowl predictions so we can bring them back if we're right <laughs> and forget them if we're wrong. Love it. Love it. So for Adam Sudzinski and Dan Weeder, I'm David Haw. Thank you for listening to the Take the North podcast and watching on the 670 Scores YouTube page. We'll talk to you next time. Great talk. See you out there.